Test fit this tube now. Farkle butt. That's not good. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Bloody Hacks. I'm back on the fire tube boiler build today, and I'm going to make the eponymous fire tubes. Now, we need a lot of these, 26 to be exact, so this will be an interesting exercise in fixturing for mass production. Sometimes even a simple part like these can be interesting when you need a whole bunch of them. So let's go. Here's the story so far. I've got my two tube plates done. One on the top there that has two extra holes for the steam valves and then one below with matching holes everywhere else. So now we need 26 fire tubes to give us the sweet, sweet surface area that gives the evaporative power to the boiler. I'm gonna start by making one perfect fire tube just to get a feel for the process. So I rough cut this one to length with the tubing cutter there. Now I need to deburr that so I can take some proper measurements here. Copper leaves really nasty burrs that'll mess with the measurements. So now I know how much I need to take off and it's over to the lathe and I'll face off both ends here with the collet chuck. And just like anything else that you're trying to get to a precise length in the lathe, you face one end, deburr it, flip it around, face the other end, deburr it, measure it, face off the remainder, and then your part will be at the perfect length. Now this is very labor intensive, so as I'm doing this, I'm thinking about how I'm gonna mass produce these things, because I need 26 of them, and I certainly don't wanna make them all this way. I did do a little test to see if I can use the back of the collet chuck as a stop, but no, it won't uh, won't stop them in time. The tubes will disappear inside of there. So if you had a 5C collet chuck, you could set a collet stop in there, which might make this process quicker. But uh, I'm going to try something different instead of using the lathe for repeatability here. Now all these tubes need to be deburred inside and out, and I've got a couple of trick Noga tools for that. So that's looking good, and the length is dead nuts. So this is my prototype canonical tube, if you will. Now, let's see how that length is on the actual boiler. I made it to the length in my drawing, but before I make 25 more of these, let's make sure that this is the length that I want. The goal here is to have just a little bit of stick up, like, I don't know, 100 thousandths or something above and below each tube plate, just enough for a nice silver solder joint. I don't want them to stick up too much because it'll take up room in the smoke box where I might want to put, you know, a feed water heater or something else. And I don't want them to stick down too low where they might create hot spots in the fire. So that is looking just about right. I think that's what I want. In order to hold them in place for silver soldering, I'm going to do a trick I saw in one of the boiler building books, which is to use the dead center from your lathe as a little bit of a flaring tool. Now, obviously it's sacrilegious to use your dead center as a punch, but this is just copper, so it's really okay. You're not going to hurt it doing this. So just tapping that in there a little bit flares the end of that tube just enough that it won't fall through the top tube plate. So you can solder the top in first, and then that's going to hold it in place, and then you can flip it over and solder the other ends or solder if you prefer. Every time I say that word, my non-Canadian Commonwealth compatriots tease me about it, and I like a good teasing as much as the next person. But just so we're clear, the country that pronounces this, Lester, has no moral high ground on phonetically literal pronunciation. After a couple more iterations of tappy tap tap and test fit, I think I've got the right amount of flare there to hold the tube at the right height. So that looks really good. So now I have the entire process end-to-end -end for making one of these tubes. So now it's time to figure out how to make a whole bunch of them because, as I said, I need a lot of them. So the idea I had for this was to make a repeatable tubing cutter. This is not something that I've seen commercially, so let's see if we can make one. I've got some threaded rod here, and if I can attach this to the tubing cutter, I can create an adjustable stop that should allow me to make precise tubing cuts in the same place each time. So let's give it a shot. I cut a length of threaded rod and I will put this in the collet chuck and I'll just clean up the ends here and make them nice. And uh, yeah, that threaded rod is a little too long for my collet chuck here. This collet chuck is homebrew and it has a solid draw bar so you can't feed very long stock all the way through it like you could with a draw tube collet chuck. But it does what I need most of the time just fine. So I cleaned up the ends of that real nice, and now I'd like to mount this threaded rod right there on the tubing cutter. 
but this thing is a very weird shape, so it might be a little tricky to fixture for this drilling and tapping. Luckily, I have just the thing. This is a tilting fixture plate that was donated to me this year by a fan at the Barzi Bash. You know who you are. Thank you very much. This thing is absolutely incredible. Uh, it's Japanese made and just really, really beautifully built. Now, it just needs a little cleanup. It's got a bunch of old uh, lubricant and whatever varnish on there. There's some old grease in there and stuff. So I'm just going to do a real quick cleanup on this thing. If you find tools like this at yard sales or whatever, don't be afraid to buy them because they usually clean up very well as you can see here. All that old varnish and grease just cleans right off with WD-40. Anywhere that's tight you can use some Q-tips to get in there. There's a mix of oil and grease on those gear teeth. So like many old tools, the previous owners clearly did not all agree whether it should be oiled or greased and so there's a sludge of both in there. You can see this little worm gear here that does the driving. It's very, very nicely made. There's some old grease on there, which is easy to clean off. Now with everything cleaned up, I'm gonna re-oil it. Now I'm gonna go with oil on this, whey oil specifically, because it's easy to access this for lubrication. That's my general rule of thumb is if things are easy to access and they aren't moving too fast, then I'll put whey oil on them. If it's uh, something like gears that are hard to get to or something, I might use grease, but I think whey oil will work fine here. And that is very, very nice. With oil on everything and the surfaces cleaned up, it's just smooth like glass. That's really quite amazing. This thing is in really incredible shape. I have no idea how old it is. Now to clean up the top a little bit, I've got my precision ground flat stones, courtesy of Lance Balsey over at 26 Acre Maker. And I'm just going to take any dings off the table that might be in there and uh, see if those stains might clean off of there. And uh, they didn't in the end, but you know they're not proud of the surface or anything. So whatever those stains are, they're not hurting anything. Okay, over to the mill now, and I will bolt this down to my T-slots. This thing is just a perfect size for my mill and for the type of projects that I do. I'm very excited about it. You can see how smooth it is. It almost falls down on its own just from the weight. It's really quite amazing. To set up the tubing cutter next, I've got a piece of drill rod here that uh, won't be hurt if I dig into it a little bit with the cutter. And I'm going to just clamp the tubing cutter onto it. This will hold the tubing cutter square to the mill spindle, and then I just lowered it down onto the, my fixture table here. And my idea was originally I would change the angle of the table to match the taper that's in the body of this cutter. But what's actually happening is the tubing cutter is sitting on the movable jaw there, which is actually square. So the angled table here is actually not going to help us. So I just shimmed up the other corners with some adjustable parallels and some scrap and uh, some shims. There's an old Allen wrench there and some copper shim. And then I'll clamp this down with my little strap clamp set here that happens to fit this little table very well. I did have to make those T-nuts under there. I, of course, didn't have any that were the right size for this little table, but I didn't show that because I think two videos on making T-nuts is enough for any one machining channel. To establish the location, I put the threaded rod in the spindle and put a nut on it, and that'll tell me how much clearance I need. I want to make sure I can spin the nut there with the movable jaw close by, so I just positioned the mill here in what looked like a good position there, and then I zeroed the DRO on that spot, and that'll be my spot. I'm trying to have it be close to where the most common tubing sizes that I cut will be as well. I want to kind of be in line with the cutter there a little bit. The body of this thing is a weird shape, so I'm going to make a flat spot here first with a two flute end mill. I have no idea what this tubing cutter is made of. It feels like aluminum, but it seems to be painted maybe or coated in some form, but we'll find out. And yep, it looks like aluminum. I don't know what the coating on it is, probably just paint, but it certainly milled very well. On to the center drill now. Just get this in the chuck there, secure that. Now here's a pro machining tip always use the unbroken end of the center drill. That's not something that you see suggested a lot, but I have really found that it helps quite a bit with getting good center drills. Now with that established, I can come in with the tapping drill size for quarter 20, which for those of you not used to ancient ridiculous measuring systems, that's a number seven for some reason. And now with my spring loader tap follower, a little WD-40 on there, and let's go ahead and tap those threads. I'm just tapping them straight through. I suppose it could be a blind hole, but eh, whatever. Tapping through is easier. 
a little brushy brush brush and let's do a test fit there so the idea is the quarter 20 rod will thread in and then there's a jam nut on there that'll hold it in place and that looks like that's going to work the flat spot there is big enough for the nut to spin and it's not going to interfere with the movable jaw on the cutter so we are good clean everything up and of course we're going to have to do some deburring there as is tradition now the threaded rod goes back in get it flush with the back there jam nut goes down okay now we need an end stop for the other end to set the length of the tube so i got a rough idea how big it should be there with the scale I'm going to make it out of brass because I happen to have this chunk of rectangular bar stock that looks about right. So I will tap, tap, tap that into the mill and clean up one end here. I'm going to clean up the top surface and I'm going to do it with the fly cutter for no reason other than I've never fly cut brass and I want to give it a try. Really the only mechanical goal here is to make the top surface parallel to the mill table so that when I drill the hole for the threaded rod, it's going to be very square to this surface. This will uh, hopefully make the tool as repeatable as possible because the measuring surface of the stop and the threaded rod will be very square to each other. That's really the only objective here, but that finish passes the scale test. You can read the numbers, so yeah, fly cutters never cease to amaze me. I'll center this up now with the edge finder and find one end to get a good distance for my hole. And in that goes with the center drill and then once again the number seven tap drill. And then I will once again tap that quarter 20. Now this actually will turn out to be a little bit of a design mistake. I think it would have been better to have a through hole here and then have nuts on both sides. That would make it more finely adjustable because as you'll see here, the adjustability of this being threaded depends on you being able to rotate the stop to the correct orientation that then also influences the distance of that stop to the cutter. So could have been a little better design there because of that, but in the end that didn't actually end up affecting it very much. Now, I don't actually want to machine all the surfaces of this thing to clean them up, so I took it over to the Scotch-Brite wheel and just gave the other sides a little shine. And again, this is totally unnecessary. This thing's going to tarnish in two weeks anyway, but eh, for YouTube, I'll make it look nice. It does help to knock all the corners off, makes it more pleasant to use. So there's my stop, as it were. The super fancy fly cut side will go towards the cutter because I know that's the side that is square. So I thread that onto the rod. And here again, you know, I'm losing some accuracy because that's threaded. You could also use a disc here instead of an arm, and then it wouldn't matter what the orientation of it is. You could thread it in and out to whatever depth precisely that you needed, but that would be a very large disc of brass. Now I've got my odd leg dividers here, and I'm going to set them on the calipers to get the length, and I'm going to scribe the length of one tube here that I want. And this is going to be used to set my stop. So I'm lining up the cutter on that scribe mark there, the cutting wheel, which is in the top half there on the fixed jaw. And then I thread my stop down to line up with the edge of that pipe. And the end of that pipe has been cleaned up. It's been deburred and faced. So this should be a precise setting. Okay, first test run of this thing. Let's see how it goes. Well, it certainly seems to spin around there just fine. On each pass, I'm giving the knob a little snug there. And eventually this thing will cut all the way through that pipe. And there it goes. All right, well, it cut a pipe. Let's see if it's the right length. So to measure accurately, I'm going to deburr it first. I've actually found that using these side deburring tools works better than the chamfering type on these tubes. So everything cleaned up. Measure it with the calipers here and see how we did. And that is dead nuts on. Like, wow. I mean, dead nuts by the caliper anyway. That's pretty actually amazing. That's better than I expected. Well, that's all well and good, but can it do it twice? If not, then it's not repeatable, which is the whole point of this exercise. So I cut a second tube with the exact same setting on the stop there. Completely unscribed. So let's deburr that once again and measure this one. And oh, once again, within a thousandth there on the calipers. That's just basically perfect. That honestly works way better than I thought it did. I figured there'd be sources of error all over the place here, like the threaded rod flexing or being at a funny angle or, you know, the block shifting or I don't know. I didn't really expect this to work quite as well as it does, but uh, yeah, this thing is cranking out perfectly length tubes in very, very short order. So very pleased with this thing. 
I guess outside of boiler making, the world doesn't have much need for a repeatable tubing cutter, which is maybe why this doesn't exist, but I'm sure glad I made it. Honestly, it took less time to make than t making this video about it is taking, so uh, if you need to do a job like this, I heartily recommend this. This was, of course, followed by an epic deburring job for which there was no shortcut available. Those uh, tubing cutters, of course, have a deburring tool built into the back of them, but I don't find they work very well, so I use my Noga tools. And then, of course, I had to flare the ends of all of these tubes, but this actually went quite quickly. You get into kind of a rhythm where your arm gets calibrated. You know exactly how hard to swing and how many times, and the tubes all come out very, very close to each other. So that went quicker than you might think. There's all my tubes installed, except for one. You might be noticing the one in the middle is missing. What's going on there? Well, this is happening. That center tube hole is much too large. So what happened here? Well, remember back when I was making the tube plates, I explained the drawing effect that happens when you flange a copper plate. It stretches the material and it pulls it from elsewhere. Well, I made this reference hole in the center the same size as a fire tube, which was a mistake. I should have made it smaller because then when I flanged the plate, it drew the material away from the center a little bit and enlarged that hole. So now I need to compensate here somehow. I was hoping I could get away with it, but there's too much clearance there for silver solder, I think. So let's see how big this hole actually is. The gauge pins say this hole is 396, which means I've got over a 10 thou clearance all the way around my 3 8 fire tube. That's too much for silver solder. The limit is generally considered to be 6 thou, so that's not gonna cut it. I thought of a lot of different solutions to this problem, but in the end, what I found is that 396 is very close to 10 millimeter with a 2 thou clearance all the way around, which is perfect. And you can buy 10 millimeter copper tubing that has a wall thickness of one millimeter, which is actually perfect. That's the same thickness that I need for all the other tubes. So yeah, the solution just fell into my lap. I bought a piece of 10 millimeter tubing on McMaster, cut that to length, flared it, dropped it in, and it was perfect. So in the end, this is kind of the perfect Canadian boiler. It's part imperial, part metric. And you metric folks can rest easy knowing that inside my mostly imperial boiler, there's one metric tube in there, just waiting for its moment. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching me make these fire tubes and making me make a weird repeatable tubing cutter for some reason. It's a strange tool that I'll never be able to explain to anyone. Thank you very much for watching. If you're liking this content, and maybe if you can throw me a little love there on Patreon if you can swing it, it means a lot to me, keeps the channel going, and I'll see you next time.